those who will not be able to join us via Zoom or in person. So you will all from home see a little pop-up pop up on your screen. All right, and with that, we will go ahead and get started. So my name is Ashanti Pickett. I am a senior here at UNCW studying marine biology with a concentration in marine conservation. I am so happy to be here with you all and celebrating POC once again. Hi, I am Michaela O'Neill. I am also a senior here at UNCW studying marine biology with a minor in environmental studies. And I'm excited to be here with you also for round number two. <laughs> Hi everyone, I am Maritza Mercado. I am also a senior studying oceanography here at UNCW. So a little bit of background about who I am. I am the president of the Alpha Psi Lambda National Incorporated. It is the first and largest co-ed Latino fraternity. And we, fun fact, we are the only chapter so far currently in North Carolina. I am also a Mikasa mentor here at UNCW and a boost mentor at Duke University. All righty, so let's get started. What does Hispanic or Latino actually mean? Latin America is divided into several regions, North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean islands, representing many different countries. Most Hispanics living in the US say they are identifying themselves as their family's Latin origin. So a little bit about my background. I am the first generation born in the United States. However, my family originally is from Mexico, so I identify as Mexicana. While Spanish is often a common and most known language of Latin America, there is also rooted languages of Portuguese and French. So a little bit more background on Hispanic or Latino. So Hispanic includes all those from Spain and Latin America whose language is Spanish. While Latino is including those from Latin America, which Latin languages stem from Spanish, Spain, Portuguese, Portugal, and then French from France. Okay. So three Nobel Prize winners from Latin America. We'll start with Luis Walter Alvarez from Spain and Cuba, who in 1968 received it for physics, discovering the etern elemental particles. While we go on to Cesar Milstein in 1984 for medicine, he is from Argentina for the monoclonal antibodies, which fun fact, also currently being used for the COVID-19 treatment. And lastly, Mario Molina, from Mexico in 1995 for chemistry, causing of ozone depletion. Okay, next we're gonna move on to Carlos Swan Finlay. He is a Cuban epidemiologist who is recognized as a pioneer in the research of yellow fever, determining that it was transmitted through mosquitoes. His work is often attributed to Walter Reed. He was nominated seven times for a Nobel Peace Prize, but never won. He was also elected president of the American Public Health Association in 1905. Okay, next, we're going to move on to some Hispanic women leaders in STEM, and we're going to start with Ellen Ochia, who was the first Hispanic woman in space and director of the Johnson Space Center. She originates from Mexico. We're going to move on to France Ordova, who is the first woman to serve as NASA's chief scientist and first Latina director of NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, and she's also from Mexico. And then next, we're going to talk about Nicole Hernandez Hammer, who is a climate activist for the Union of Concerned Scientists and Deputy Director of the Florida Center for Environmental Study, and she is from Guatemala. Moving on, we will be talking about Ms. Nubia Munoz. She is a Columbian, Colombian pathologist and epidemiologist who discovered the human papilloma virus as the main cause for cervical cancer. This work earned her a nomination for the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2008 as well as the Canadian Gardner Global Health Prize in 2009. Next up, we have Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, who spent most of her early childhood in Puerto Rico. And then afterwards, her family moved to New York when she was 10 years old, where she was faced with racism as well as discrimination. She experienced this bias simply for being a Latina woman and was placed in a class with students who were academically handicapped, even though she had great grades and was well fluent in English. This experience would shape the professional and professional activism throughout the rest of her life. In 1993, the American Public Health Association did an amazing thing and elected her their first Latina president. 
Next up, we have Mr. Jaime Escalante. For those of you who are familiar with this name, you will see why in just a moment. He was a math teacher and he hailed from Bolivia and he challenged the testing system for the bias towards Hispanic youth during his calculus class. Now, um, during this calculus class, they had a testing that they went through and they received such high scores that the program believed that the, his students were cheating. Now, he eventually was able to handle this situation by some of his students retaking this test and received even higher grades the second time. And then, you know, if you guys would like to learn more about his wonderful story, you can check out the book or the movie called Stand and Deliver. Now we're gonna share an amazing quote from the first woman of color, first Hispanic and first Latina member of the Supreme Court. She originated from Puerto Rico. In every position that I've been in, there have been naysayers who don't believe I'm qualified or who don't believe I can do the work. And I feel a special responsibility to prove them wrong from Sonia Sotomayor. Now, please join us in welcoming our panelists for a discussion about the coloring of STEM. So first we have Dr. Jennifer Martinez via Zoom. We have, unfortunately, Caroline Veloso Oliviera is unable to join us, but she does have some remarks she will say in the chat below. So please welcome. So Dr. Jennifer Martinez, if you would like to share anything, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, hi everybody. Um, it is, wow, just an honor to be here um, to join you guys and oh, the nervousness. I don't know what I'm nervous about, anxious about, but um, you know, talking about my history and my journey, um, it, I think it's unorthodox for this kind of um, panel discussion. So you talk about Sonia Sotomayor, her motivation was about proving others wrong. And I feel like a lot of my lifetime, I spent proving myself wrong. Um, so to go into a little bit about my background, um, a molecular and cellular biologist. I teach in the biology marine biology department. I'm a lecturer. Um, I don't do research, um, just primarily teaching and a little bit um, more about that when I talk about my journey. But um, I finished up my third year. Um, I'm going into my, I'm in my fourth year now at UNCW. I did work two years at Evergreen State University in Washington State um, after I uh, graduated from grad school. But, um, a little bit about my journey. I guess I, I was born and raised in New York on Long Island. And for most of my life, I never even thought about my culture, never even thought about my heritage, didn't really think of myself being different, even though I grew up in the suburbs, um, you know, it was a diverse town I grew up in in Bayshore, um, but in elementary school, we had to take achievement tests. And from going into fifth grade, from fourth grade, the achievement test basically separated who was gonna be in an enrichment program or not. And I scored high in the math, portion of the achievement test. So they put me in these enrichment classes uh, starting from fifth grade. And at the time I had no idea, um, but I think back now and I was the only Spanish person in that class. And um, I, don't, I don't think it really affected me in any way. Um, there was another person of color in the, in the class, but um, I don't think, we, I think we were just too young and naive to know that there was a difference. And so speeding right along, um, I wanted to be a doctor at that time. I was going to going to be a doctor, no matter what, going to medical school, the whole bit, but my family wasn't 
rich. We didn't have money for me to go to medical school. I had three older brothers, um, two of them that uh, went off to college. And, you know, we didn't have money like that. So when I was in sixth grade, my dad basically told me, hey, you're a good athlete. Let's pick a sport. Let's be really good at it and maybe get some sort of sports scholarship, athletic scholarship. And my town, Bayshore, was really good at softball. And they won states, you know, a number of times. And the coach was known for getting girls into college on athletic scholarships. So I'm like, okay, I'll be a softball pitcher. So I ended up um, practicing really hard and softball became my number one. And again, on the softball team, I think I might've been one or out of two Spanish girls on the entire team. The rest of the team was white. And I, again, naive, I didn't realize, I didn't notice it. I kind of just grew up in that, that culture of, you know, I don't, I don't know, just not knowing who I was and not recognizing who I was. And I think I was okay with that at that time. Anyway, I ended up loving sports, loving softball, um, being really good at it at the time. And I got a scholarship to go to Stony Brook University. So I went there thinking, I'm ready for medical school and, you know, um, this is going to pay my way. I got this full scholarship to go here. And then I got injured. And then reality hit that maybe medical school wasn't for me. Um, we had a lot of financial problems at the time in my family. And I decided, you know, I was really good at coaching. I, I ended up you know, coaching little girls and teaching them how to pitch at like seven, eight years old. And um, I loved it. I'm like, maybe I should teach. I love biology. So why don't I teach biology? So I ended up transferring schools to um, St. Joseph's College and, and getting my secondary ed degree. When I went to St. Joseph's College, I didn't realize I would be not just the minority, but almost the minority of the minority. Uh, um, where I didn't have a face, I didn't have a belief system. It was just one of the schools on Long Island that was really good for teaching teachers how to teach. And um, again, like I was aware of where I was, but wasn't aware of who I was. And I just was really good at biology and I was really good at science. So Everywhere I went, I felt like I earned where I was, so it didn't hit me, right? So I was really good at sports, so I got the athletic scholarship. It had nothing to do with my heritage, right? Um, when I graduated St. Joseph's College, I graduated magna cum laude. I was really good at science, really good at biology, and therefore I, I felt like I earned what I got, right? And then grad school happened, and... I applied to graduate school because I felt like two years substituting high school, um, high school just wasn't for me. And so I went on and when I interviewed, well, let's start with the application process. I applied late. I had no business being in the interview process at all. Not only did I apply late, I also applied with uh, an incomplete application. I didn't submit all my transcripts because really at the time I was like, do I really want to go to grad school? Hey, let's apply. It was late the whole bit. Well, I get a call from the director of the molecular and cellular biology program, the graduate program at Stony Brook. And it's like, why don't you come in for an interview? It's like, okay. So I go in and the director was Dr. Stern Glantz at the time. And we met for about an hour. And during that hour is when he got all my transcripts, my academic transcripts. Before that, he had no idea about my academic standing. Um, all he saw at the end of the application was the EZ at the end of my name. And later on, I found out that that was the only reason I got the interview. And that was the only reason I got into this program was because of the EZ at the end of my last name. And um, anyway, I, I get into grad school, yay. Um, and I'm there not, again, not really realizing why I was there. 
I take my first molecular genetics exam and I got a 46. That's right, 46, not out of 50, 46 out of 100, okay? I was bawling my eyes out because it was at this point where I was like, maybe I don't belong here. And that imposter syndrome, I almost still feel it a little bit, like I'm getting a little bit choked up because I remember how upset I was. And I walked <laughs> from my class to Dr. Sternglanz's office, just walked straight into his office and was like, I got a 46. I got a 46. Well, then he went on to tell me that the average of the class was a 65. So 46 really wasn't that bad. But for me, I graduated magna cum laude, right? For me, I'm supposed to, this was not normal for me. And anyway, he got me in touch with the CIE at Stony Brook University. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, the CIE is the Center for Inclusive Education. Um, they had a program called the AGEP program uh, for graduate students of minorities and underrepresented backgrounds. And that's when I learned about who I was and why I was there. Um, I know the only reason I got into that program was because I was a minority and because there was funding for minorities. So any research laboratory that would have taken me in would have gotten free labor pretty much um, government funded labor because I was part of their lab and but the thing that got me through because the imposter syndrome was awful after that first exam I took my biochem exam that same semester my first biochem exam I got an A so yay didn't feel as bad but still knew I didn't really belong. But the CIE, with their mentorship, their tutoring, um, what it seems like the fellowship that the POC is trying to do here at UNCW, um, that was the best thing for me because that encouraged me and that got me through graduate school. That group got me through graduate school. It had it not been for the mentors that I had, um, that you know, they went through it, they went through the imposter syndrome, they went through the same courses I took, and they told me, you can do this, you know. Um, had it not been for them, I never would have been able to make it through. So I don't know if that was more long-winded than you guys really wanted, um, but yeah, that's that's my journey through through grad school. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Dr. Martinez. I feel like us up here, we can definitely relate to that imposter syndrome and some of your college experiences there. All right, next up, would you like to come up and say a couple of words, Mr. Jose? <laughs> All right, everyone give it up for Mr. Jose. can see me now and hear me, right? Yeah. All right. Um, so my name is Jose Borja. I'm a UNCW alum. Is that, is that how you say? Alum? Alum? <laughs> All right. So um, I graduated from the Department of Marine Biology and Biology and Environmental Science on undergrad. And then I got my master's right afterwards. So uh, environmental science. So um, the imposter syndrome is pretty real, you know, even today. And I have a, a job, career. You still wonder, you know, am I in the right spot? And you try to do your best every day, but um, I, I wasn't like Ms. Mart uh, Dr. Martinez said. You know, sometimes you try to prove people wrong, but I was I was trying to prove myself right. You know that I was at the place where I needed to be, and um, honestly, I don't know where I need to be. I just know I'm here today, and I'm gonna keep going. I don't know where I'm going, but it's gonna get there, wherever that is. I don't know. Uh, that's just honestly. Um, and then like Dr. Martinez was saying as well. You know, mentorship. You know, it's always nice to have somebody there helping you, guiding you. And uh, for me, I think it was uh, UNCW Centro Hispano. They, they have a way to like just pump you up. They're like, yeah, 
environmental science, yeah, do it. I was like, what am I doing again? I'm like, <laughs> you do it though. So I was like, okay, cool, cool. I'll keep going. And then um, it's just a place where it just motivated you to keep on going. And then, uh, when, so I transferred to UNCW from Samson Community College and, uh, you know, we did a little bit of uh, labs, experiments and stuff. And it wasn't until, you know, I started taking environmental science 195 and we actually got to go out and explore, you know, UNC, uh, Wilmington and UNCW in general. And I thought it was really fun hanging out outside. So I was like, man, you now my friends were like, yeah, we just joined this lab. I was like, what do you mean you just joined a lab? You know, as a, as an immigrant from Mexico whose parents didn't go to school, you're wondering, what do you mean you joined the lab? Like, doing something? I'm like, yeah, we don't go to class. We do, we do volunteering and work in labs. I was like, oh, that's cool. I like, let me go ask my professor about it. I was like, hey, Dr. Kamel, um, what, what are you doing in your lab? Well, Jose, we work with uh, periwinkle snails. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm like, we were studying uh, predator avoidance behaviors. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. I go in here, you know, thinking we're, we're going to do like, I'm about to fight this, like this monster, you know, we're predators, you know, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I go in here, uh, we're studying behaviors of evasion, snow's going up, um, you know, buckets, you know, it was really fun. I was like, wow, I can't believe this is actually fun, you know, the experience of just being out there in nature and actually contributing to a, a lab just changes you and you just want to know more and your curiosity just grows and then you're like, man, what's after this? Like, I want to keep doing something like this. And the, and the only thing that I really knew how to do was agriculture. And apparently now I knew how to work with snails. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know which one I want to do. So I went to grad school trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And uh, so I went to grad school. And when you apply to grad school, apparently you have to have like a good GPA, you know? And uh, mine wasn't the best. And it was not because of my professors. You know, it was just tough trying to figure out how to balance everything all at once. So I asked another really great professor. I was like, hey, Ms. Long, you think, you think I'd be a good choice for the program? She was like, Jose, you have nothing to worry about. It, you could totally do it, right? And I asked, asked uh, some of my uh, close coworkers, life's friends, Dr. Segovia and Chris, you're like, you think I could do it? Like, you'd be perfect for it. I don't know what you're even like concerned about. So I applied. I was like, I'm not going to get in. My GPA is really low. I just don't want to tell you how low because this is getting reported, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. At least for me, it was bad, you know, because in high school, you know, you're you're achieving, you're you have like, uh, you're on a principal's list, and you're like, oh man, I'm doing great, and then you kind of uh, you and you're like, oh man, <laughs> yeah. So I applied and uh, I got in. Yeah, I know my my uh, my graduate letter of acceptance said in probation. I was like, okay, that'll work. That, that's fine. That's totally fine. I could totally do it. So my, you know, they told me just gotta get your grades up and just prove to you, you know, prove to us that you um, eligible to stay here. So I did, and uh, I really loved it, and. Being in that program, you realize that not a lot of Hispanic students go to get their master's degree, and then you feel like, and you feel like you're still wondering, do I belong here? And, you know, so uh, there was a small group of us who were like, "Hey, let's start a Latin Latinx graduate, you know, student association on campus." You know, and that you have to get, like I said, mentorship is really important. And we had the uh, back then it was called uh, what's it called, Le, um, Le Gypsum. They were on campus, so we like we got the guidance. How do you set one up? And they showed us how to do it, and uh, they helped us out a lot. And then it was a small handful of us, but when we got together, man, we felt like we run the campus. We were like, dang, we're top dogs now. Little did we know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was really fun just hanging out with other Hispanic, other Latino students who had the same mentality as you, who grew up the same way, who were just wondering, you know, how to go to the next level. And then, then you realize that when you join that group, oh shoot. I'm actually more, you have more challenges than they did, you know, like uh, my parents are both farm workers and, you know, their parents are like entrepreneurs. I'm like, oh, shoot. I didn't realize how bottom of the bottom I was, you know, it was money wise, economic wise, but, you know, I've always strived to be the best and to myself, maybe not the best and, you know, to everybody else, but I was to be the best version I wanted myself because tomorrow I don't know who I'll be, but today I know who I am. Um, so it's been, it's been a journey. I don't think it's over yet. And uh, just seeing everybody here. Um, and then Dr. Kamel's here too. Hi, Dr. Kamel. Like, you were my favorite. You were my favorite. Don't tell, Christina, Christina's up here too, by the way. No, she's my favorite. But, she's my other favorite. but like, it just takes one person to really hype you up and like to give you the motivation. And I was really lucky that I had so many people. And Dr. Kizios too, she just called me in one day and she was like, I was like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't know. 
And then she was like, well, you know, we're doing this thing. Would you like to do it? I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. And this was when I first met you a while back. And, you know, she's, she also hyped me up. She was so happy for me, like, keep going, you know, just keep going. And Dr. Kamel, Ms. Long, and everybody at the AVS department, Dr. Segovia and Chris, you know, they're just, you just have to have a mentor and somebody to do it. So, so next time you have a science buddy who needs a research partner, grab him by the hand and be like, hey, let's go, let's go check out some snails. Because you don't know where that'll lead somebody, you know, it, somebody would just be like so hyped up. And that's just my story. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them at the end. And thank you for having me. I'll walk out now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, please give our speakers another round of applause really quick. Thank you all so much. And next up, we have a few questions that we have that we would love for you guys to try and answer. As well as our third speaker today was unable to join us via Zoom or in person, but she will have some information that we will be putting in the chat for all of you all at home to see. And if you guys can't hear um, Jose whenever he is speaking, just let us know and we can make sure we get our sound ready for you guys. All right, so for our first question, we have for our panelists, how do you all feel? Sorry. How do you feel your journey in STEM has been impacted due to your heritage? And it's for either of you guys to answer whenever you're ready. Okay, one more time is how do you feel your journey in STEM has been impacted due to your heritage? Take your time, no rush. <laughs> I could chime in. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, I definitely wouldn't have gotten into graduate school had I not been, um, not marked, you know, Latino on my application or, um, so that definitely impacted me. Um, I felt like, the CIE, the group that I was a part of, um, made me learn more about my heritage. It, it forced me to look more at myself for it. So I think um, more of the culture shock for myself, learning about, you know, my mom was born in Puerto Rico and my just knowing about their history and learning about my ancestry there in Puerto Rico, it, um, it kind of all jumpstarted, all because I got into graduate school. So. Jennifer, can you hear me? Jennifer? Yeah, can she hear me? Okay, great. It's Stephanie. Hey. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I just I'm so glad as, I didn't say anything about the department because I didn't really. Oh, I'm just oh my kidding. Gosh. I'm That's just fine. Kidding. It's not a very good department. Um, so it's I'm awesome. just kidding. Um, I so as oh oh hush, it's a wonderful department. But I'm asking you a question. You've mentioned a couple of times now, and this is really interesting to me that you got into graduate school because of your heritage. And so we've been talking about increasing diversity in the graduate program in biology. And so is that is that a bad approach to say to an applicant, oh gosh, look, we have this Hispanic applicant. Um, you know, we should we should take her, we should take him. Um, is that is that the wrong way to to do it? You know, to allocate funds specifically to hire or to recruit a minority applicant? Like what what do you how do you feel about that? What do you, do you have? I have mixed feelings about mm -hmm. it you, only because I think because I spent most of my life in ignorance 
that once it finally came up and I was like, oh, I'm only here because I'm a minority. I don't know how I would have, if I would have felt better had they just told me in the beginning, hey, you're here, right? Because I only had this interview with the director opposed to any other grad school interview where you interview with, you know, seven or eight different faculty and you get tours of the campus. I didn't get that, right? So would it have been different for me had they told me right from the beginning, hey, you're being signed on because you're minority, you, you, feel, you fit the bill for it? I don't know how I would have reacted to that. I, I think I was better off in ignorance and learning on my own. Um, okay and then telling me that but as far as others who you know who are you know born and raised elsewhere and then you know come into the United States and whether you I don't know I really don't know how I feel about it because the whole thing is trying to be a face for students so students can relate to you right so students can identify with those that are um you know, the same background as them. But I also feel like there aren't very many students that have a background like mine that grew up in ignorance and, right? But that's that imposter syndrome that I always try to prove myself wrong, that there are others. There's obviously other students that were born and raised in the United States who are just looking for, you know, a familiar face. So I don't, I don't know. I do have mixed feelings about it. I'm not one way or the other. That's good to know. It's hard to we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to figure out how to increase diversity, how to color STEM, like you said, but right. how to do it in a way that's appropriate. And I think that's the tricky part um, yeah. is, is how to do that right. Thanks, Jennifer. If y'all hiring, I'm available, like for real. <laughs> I think there might be somebody on Zoom who's got a question. I see a hand raised. Okay, um, so for the person who has a question, would you mind going ahead and unmuting yourself? Or if you're not comfortable with that, maybe put it in the chat. The chat can be oh. Hello everybody, this is Edel Segovi. I hope you can hear me. Yes, ma'am, we can. Thank you so much for uh, putting this program together and for the invitation. Uh, and it's a pleasure, just a, a, a treat for me to see Jose here after so many, so, so many years. So thank you so much for Jose for your presentation and thank you, Jen, for your inspiration uh, and, and sharing your journey with us. I just wanted to um, just plug in uh, uh, a little piece on the recruitment piece for uh, uh, bringing diverse uh, individuals into STEM or, or into any, any field for that matter. Um, yes, there's definitely mixed feelings as to whether you should have uh, a specific uh, allotment for diverse populations or not, but I wanted to expand on uh, the note of being in, in this field, being in at the master's level or at the university uh, because you're a minority, I like to flip that and say, I am here in spite of being a minority. I am here in spite of having faced so many challenges uh, assigned to me just because of my race or ethnic background or because I may be a language minority. So um, as, a, as a professional educator, I've been in, in public ed for 22 years now, I always wonder what would be the, uh, the reach of my students had they not had those stumbling blocks? For some of us, we will never know what that reach may have been. We can only gauge where we've gotten overcoming, you know, uh, a challenge after challenge after challenge. But um, in any, anything that we can do to uh, make the list of the added value that that individual brings with them. The added value in the tested and tried resiliency in the tested and tried resourcefulness that they have had to uh, just uh, run their lives through always uh, in the uh, you know falling early and picking yourself up time and time again. And in, in the sometimes not having somebody to believe in you but having to believe in yourself 
uh, the experience that um, both uh, at, at this point the three of us have had is that we have had mentors, uh, but sometimes it took us a little while to find those mentors. So maybe we had to lean on ourselves as we were finding that. But, but um, we also want to be careful not to um, lead the student into, um, I, I guess this, would, this might code itself as internalized racism in that you may say, I am here because I am Hispanic. And so they start believing that, they start believing that they may have been given a pass or they may not, they may, they may not have been competing at the merit level along with everybody else. So every student, you know, I tell my, my students that if you're here at UNCW, my gosh, you have more than what it takes to make it. Uh, you know, you have been vetted uh, based on your academic achievement, based on your merit, um, in spite of all the challenges that you have been carrying along with you. So um, definitely we, we are champions, you are champions and uh, I, uh, you inspire me. So I just wanted to plug that piece. Okay, so now to answer your question about has, how has my heritage impacted my work in STEM? or something around those lines. Louder? Okay, now we're talking. All right, so how does my heritage impact in my, uh, you know, my, what was it again? Something like that. But the point is, uh, it was difficult staying in STEM because, you know, um, your parents or Hispanic parents, my parents did, and just in my case, perhaps, they wanted a lawyer or a doctor or something out there like that. And I was like, I don't want to work outside. And then you're like, You've been working outside your whole life. What you want to do is still working outside, you know, but uh, to me, that was freedom. It, it still is working outside. So not only do you have to, like, fight against all the naysayers, and then you have your own close family members you have to, like, almost go against, but, you know, your parents are supportive. They'll support anything you do in the end. But um, that was difficult, trying to figure out where you wanted to stay at because of all the influences beyond yourself and, uh, to this day, my mom still tells me, it wasn't it hot outside? I was like, no, it was only 105 degrees. It wasn't that bad. But then, uh, it's, it's still fun. Um, maybe when I get older, maybe I'll want to not go outside. <laughs> I, look, I look at Dr. Camille because she told me once, um, it's not as, fun, as much fun as it was before when you first started, but uh, it's still fun. It's still fun. <laughs> it, maybe later on it won't be as fun, but um, just do what you love and never regret it. So just keep pushing. And who or what did you find motivation during your STEM journey? I'll say it one more time. And who or what did you find motivation during your STEM journey? <laughs> In who or what? Okay, so um, that's a really great question. Um, like I said, I've always just wanted to be the best at, you know, at myself. And it was just fun. And um, so I found motivation in just being outside, you know. It's natural space. Hasn't really been, I guess the word I don't want to say. Yeah, it hasn't been disturbed. There you go. It's a better word. It hasn't been disturbed. It's, it's at peace. It's, it's what it needs to be at the time that it needs to be. And um, I, got that, I got that from Dr. Kamel's class, evolution. You know, it's the most perfect thing you'll be is still to come. You know, you're always evolving. Um, actually, I think Charles Darwin said that. But, uh, yeah, so that's where I got motivation from, just being outside and just wanting to be out there. You know, you're carefree. You know, the animals don't judge you. The plants don't judge you. And um, they just want to live in some other relationship with you. So that's where I found my motivation. And, uh, and the who, I think, is... Um, all, everybody that just cared, you know, they just kept pushing from your close friends to your professors to your mentors. That's who I found the motivation from to keep going. You know, you, you will have that doubt and like, oh, shoot, if I go into this career, am I going to make enough to eat? It doesn't matter. Just keep going. Uh, you'll find a way to figure it out and, you know, enjoy your life the best you can. And like I said, I'm enjoying it. It's, it's fun. It's great. And then 
the fact that I work with the uh, public office, I get to help people every day. So it just changes who you are as a person too. Do you have anything you would like to add to that? Is that for me? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I feel like most of my motivation during graduate school was through the fellowship and mentorship with the CIE. Really that group, um, the, the ladies in that group were just inspiring. Um, you know, they believed in me when, um, you know, I joined a lab and um, I'm not going to speak too much personal stuff of what happened in there, but um, the CIE got me through a lot of difficult situations there. And my family didn't really understand grad school. Uh, they didn't go to grad school. They didn't really, um, they didn't get it. They're like, well, why didn't you just go to medical school? And I was like, but I'm getting paid to do research and to teach, which I love, right? I'm getting paid to study biology and um, just trying to explain it to them. So they weren't so much motivation. They were there when I needed support, but I never really went to them. I went to the people in the CIE, my mentor, Alexis Santana from year one, she was my go-to whenever I had personal issues or just needed tutoring it, um, for obviously for molecular genetics that first year, um, you know, they gave me old exams so I can study those to, to be prepared. Um, they really motivated me because they were always emailing me saying, you know, come, come join us for lunch or, you know, come meet with us, tell us how you're doing. Um, they always reached out and let me know that they were there and they were supporting me and that I was gonna graduate. So it wasn't a question, it wasn't a doubt, it was you're gonna graduate. Um, so I, I would say that they were my, mo my main motivation. It's just doing it with them. Also, um, something came to mind to answer Stephanie's question, but just, um, one thing that came up when I first got to Evergreen, um, after I graduated and I got the job there, they did the orientation and in the first week of orientation, they introduced us to the faculty union and the director of the faculty union after that meeting came up to me and was like, your name is Dr. Martinez, right? I was like, yes. And she's like, um, are you Hispanic? I said, yes. She's like, you should join the union. We need somebody like you in the union. And I just remember that feeling of being the, I didn't like it. I didn't like feeling like the token Hispanic. Um, she didn't know anything about me, nothing about my merit, whether I was qualified to, to speak for anybody, let alone myself. Um, so that, that, that was an issue with me and obviously it stuck with me uh, even till now that I, I think about that. Um, but again, part of the imposter syndrome, um, what Adele was saying before is that whole perspective of, I earned this in spite of being a minority. I love that. I love that. But in my own mind, I didn't, I wasn't raised like that. I was, I was raised with, you earn it, not despite of, like, I don't feel like I overcame the challenge. I feel like the challenge was given to me because of my last name. And um, what I overcame was I graduated grad school, right? I got into grad school maybe by my name, maybe by my heritage, but I graduated grad school and that's what I achieved. So that's what kind of broke the imposter syndrome. Anyway, that was long-winded again. I'm sorry, guys. Are giving... We love that you guys are giving wonderful, like well thought out explanations. And this is definitely giving like 
a good education value to the people that are here watching on the Zoom and even to the people that will come back and watch the Zoom call later. So thank you so much. For our next question, um, Dr. K wanted to know if there is anything similar to your CIE program here at UNCW that we have available for students. Or if you guys don't know, maybe something like that. Yeah. Okay, so and look, I, I was I want to say I was blessed when having to uh, do my work study at Centro Hispano because I got to hear Dr. Segovia all the time and she was really inspiring and um, I've had an opportunity to be with a lot of like strong women, you know, and uh, being in STEM and then being a woman, I know that's that's even tougher, the challenges you have to face. So um, I have a, a high respect for women in general and everything like that. But um, so I would say that. To me, Centro Hispano was that CIE. And uh, being able to do that, being able to be their mentor with them, be a part of all their activities and just showing up at high schools with them and everybody's looking at you like, wow, you look like me. I'm like, I don't know, man. My mustache is thicker than yours, but all right. But uh, it was great. So my CIE was UNCW Centro Hispano and I wouldn't trade that experience for anything, you know, being with them. And like I said, and they were my motivators, even the students. Everybody was majoring in business, teaching. I'm over here like the lone puppy, you know, environmental science. Who the heck does that? Like, yeah, Jose does that. So when they would have, we would have high school students for the mentee program, Mikasa program, they'd be like, oh, yeah, we have a student who's majoring in environmental science. He actually works outside. How excited. Chris, uh, Chris Montero, he used to pump me up all the time. And I would be like, man, come on, calm down. He'd be like, nah, man, like, you got to get hyped. Like, these kids are looking up to you. And you're like, I guess you might be right, but I'm also looking up to them because these students, you know, they're just a whole generation of knowledge just in their brain at the age of like 14, 15. I'm over here like 20. I didn't even know that. And it's just amazing what they're learning nowadays. And um, so that's my CIE. Centro Hispano was my CIE. Thank you so much for that answer. Did anybody else have anything to add before we move on to our next question? Okay. Hi, can everyone hear me? There, okay, hi. I just wanted to like also build on that because I, as a current member, like Centro Hispano actually brought me into my community because when I first, my start with Centro Hispano was kind of kind of weird because I didn't know, I was kind of nervous. I was kind of like that student from my first semester here at UNCW. I would like go to class, go back to my dorm, go to class, go to my dorm, go to WAG, because it was right there, just come back. So Centro Hispano really gave me my friends, my family, the home away from home. And then when I got into the Mikasa program, I like felt that like, Mari majors in oceanography, like you don't hear that as often. And I'm just like, okay, I'm kind of the odd one out. Like I feel that. And then people were like, what's that? And I was like, is that, do you just do work with the ocean? Is that the same as marine bio? And then I just go into details like, no, I kind of wanted to challenge myself and be in all disciplines instead of just one specific discipline because there's just so much out there. So Centro Hispano, like getting to meet Dr. Segovia and then everyone who's here now, like we have um, Angel who works with Mikasa, which I am in a Mikasa mentor. And my mentee was like, wow, that's amazing. You do oceanography. Like I wouldn't have thought of knowing, knowing about that if it wasn't for like being out there or even meeting you. So it's an it's like an experience on its own. And then like with Che being involved there and then just meeting everyone. And then I got to see like my friends also like graduate cause like they were always older than me, but they got to graduate and go into the respective fields of like from computer science, which I don't understand to like bio to business. So it's just an amazing opportunity to see everyone go and do something. And I'm like, oh, you look like me and you get to do what you want. That's an amazing feeling. Um, so during this meeting, we've been talking a lot about imposter syndrome. So I wanted to know, because it's very common, especially in college, 
how all of you guys have been dealing with imposter syndrome. And if you guys have any advice to overcome that obstacle, let us know. And that's for anybody who would like to answer first. Uh, I don't mind answering first if that's all right. Um, right now, I'm, I feel like I'm better equipped to handle imposter syndrome. Uh, three and a half years ago, I was born again and my faith and my identity in Christ has truly overcome a lot of um, that imposter syndrome. I'm here for a reason, right? I have a purpose. I, God has a plan for me, whatever that might be. Um, but the, the method right now is facing lies with truth, right? It's not about how I feel, what are the facts, right? The fact is I was hired by UNCW, right? The fact is I'm doing a job that they asked me to do. I get evaluated by my students every semester and my evaluations have been good, right? So that means I'm, I'm doing my job. I'm doing what they hired me to do. So to say that I don't belong here, that I don't um, deserve this job. And the only reason I got it is because my last name's Martinez. I know that's not truth, right? I know that's a lie that I'm telling myself. So um, I might have doubts and feelings sometimes during faculty meetings when, um, you know, the biology, marine biology departments got the sand committee, right? Which is for uh, diversity and equity. And um, there's this feeling of, I wanna reach out and I wanna be part of that group because of what happened to me during graduate school. But I also feel like that's um, not my place right now, right? If, if I were to do that, I would be feeling a whole lot of imposter syndrome. <laughs> Right? There would be a whole lot of doubts because that's just, um, that's not what God had planned for me at the moment. The, the truth is um, that right now I'm just supposed to be teaching and, and worry about that for right now. Imposter syndrome or I think the question was somewhere around those lines. So like Dr. Martinez said, um, I have outside influence. So like I said, I, I work with Samson County Environmental Health Office. And um, if you're not familiar with Sampson County, uh, it's about 20 to 25 percent are Hispanic origin. So one out of every four applicant that comes in, you know, is Hispanic. Um, most of the time, they're pretty good in English. There's some applicants who come in who are limited English. So when they see you there in the office and they ask you all these questions, you're able to help them out. You tell yourself, "This is where I need to be." Uh, well, maybe not forever, but you know, uh, for the moment. You know, they tell you, like, thank you for your help. You know, if, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to apply for this application right here. And um, that's how my imposter syndrome gets uh, pushed down uh, by helping others and others actually appreciating your work. And, um, I'll, you know, when you're in school, have you heard of uh, academically gifted? Well, you know, and then you watch Spider-Man and then they tell you, you know, with great power comes with great responsibility. And uh, so that's, I like to live by that. You know, um, you were blessed with the brain you were blessed being bilingual and uh if you don't stand up for others in your community or your surrounding areas um if someone's speaking about them use your language use your culture to connect with them and it's it's our responsibility as bad as it sounds because you know to step up and be there be the voice of others and i try to do that you know and hopefully i can continue doing that but it, it's tough it's definitely tough to find out like if you really do belong there or not. And I, I keep telling myself that I do, so hopefully it'll keep me around for a while. Feelings about imposter syndrome. Um, but I will say, because I think this is, I, I feel like women experience it and feel it very deeply, um, pretty much their entire lives. But I will say that maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome is a good thing because I think to some extent it means that you're being thoughtful. You are thinking about what you don't know. You are thinking about, you know, your place in the world. And I think that's good. And I think 
there's a certain degree of thoughtfulness that goes along with imposter syndrome, but not to the extent that it paralyzes you. And that's the problem that you, you fundamentally do belong in grad school or an undergrad, um, but you don't know everything. And that's, that's important. But um, I, it's something that I'm always worried when a student doesn't seem to have it, right? <laughs> because then it's like, you don't, you don't know. No, Jose is very comfortable with his imposter syndrome. He's very good with asking questions and understanding what he didn't know and all that kind of stuff. But all that to say a little bit, I think is a good thing, but you absolutely deserve to be here. And that's really important to remember as well. Ashley, would you like to unmute your mic and speak, or would you like to enter your question in the chat? It's up to you. No, I can speak. Okay. Um, I just want to kind of like go off like what Dr. Martinez said. Um, when I joined the SAN committee as an undergrad, and my first meeting, I was there. I was surrounded by PhDs, holders, or like graduates, and I felt the biggest imposter syndrome because I felt like well, there's nothing I could possibly contribute because I was like the undergrad student in that committee. But um, they've been very welcoming and I see like the work that they do. And I'm really proud to be part of that. And even if sometimes I feel like I don't belong there, I'm slowly starting to accept that um, I can make an impact even if it's small. So our next, can, can you hear me? Okay. How can I be productive in the field, like in my own field or like just in general? Be productive in your field or just in general. So I would say um, enhance your communication skills. Um, be a it's hard to be a people person sometimes but um i think the the day we live in you know current times it's hard to be a people person because i have to be six feet away from somebody but um definitely enhance your communication skills being able to communicate with somebody asking the questions when you don't know the answers to communicate because uh you don't know what someone's feeling you don't know what they've gone through that day and if you can just communicate you better, better understand them, better understand your problems you're dealing with. Uh, like Dr. Kamel said, you probably won't, we probably won't know everything there is in our fields and we may never get there, but um, I think that's our job is to communicate and try to keep moving forward. So I think communication is key and everything we plan to do in the future and STEM calls for it now, outreach to the community, that's communication, being able to communicate in different ways. You know, now we're going virtual for a lot of things and have to know how to communicate virtually now and not just in person and i think i have a hard time communicating virtually that's why i came in here in person uh it's easier for me but i know i have to enhance my virtual communication skills so like i said communicate communicate and communicate Thank you so much for that input, Mr. Jose. For our next question, we have, how cost effective is this career? And don't be afraid to get honest, you guys. We can handle it. <laughs> I can chime in. <laughs> uh Dr. Kamel might be laughing because we just had our faculty meeting before talking about, you know, good old dollar sign. Um, <laughs> financially, it's, I'm okay, right? Financially, I'm okay. Um, it's, when I was going to graduate school, is this what I thought I'd be making after going to school for 10 years of my life? No, I'm going to, you know, um, after high school, spending 10 years in post high school, but, um, but it's, there's definitely funding opportunities 
um, but you have to be active and go get them. And, um, you know, they offer summer teaching here at UNCW, which has been um, a good add to the base salary here for me. Um, right now we're at a shortage of faculty members in our department, so there's plenty of opportunities for overload work. <laughs> so, so um, you know, just, just taking advantage of what, what is offered and what is out there um, in addition to the base is right now, if I'm comfortable. So I can't speak for academia that much, but um, it depends how you want to live. Cost effectiveness, it depends how you want to live. If you want to live in, a, I guess, a mansion, that you, you might want to start your own company in the STEM realm. I mean, it's possible. With STEM, it's possible. There's computer science, engineering. You can definitely achieve it depending on how you go about it. And if you add a geographic information system, you can definitely add anything to oceanography, and you can definitely live well, too uh in, in that way um but um grad school wasn't easy financially you know and i'm pretty sure we can try to get your phd is not as easy as well either but um it all depends on how you want to live and uh what your goals are realistically what you want to do with that um i know working for the county um i don't know how the school pays but the county pays eh, you know but uh I'm, I'm all right right now um but I have seen other opportunities where if you become like a private soul scientist, you can definitely get a better pay as opposed to what I'm doing. Uh, I get a, you know, a salary, but uh, as a soul scientist, you can definitely be, make more. As a server, you can make more. So if you go into the private sector, you can definitely enhance your cost effectiveness of your career or your degree as opposed to the public sector. But like I said, it just all depends on how you use your degree and what you're trying to add. So if you add in some technology to it, you can definitely see some enhancements in it. And there's always, you know, opportunities to uh, enhance your business, grants, funding, anything like that. So what do you want to do realistically and how to get there? You just got to plan it out. Right. I think there's a big difference between going to master's, uh, into a master's program than going into a PhD program, right? So for a master's program, you're paying for it, right? As a student, you're paying for it. And for my PhD program, my tuition was waived as well as we got a stipend. So I didn't need to worry about that. However, it wasn't until this past summer that I finally paid off my student loans, praise the Lord, right? Um, finally out of student loan debt. Um, so cost effectiveness, it, it like, like, Jose was saying it, it's it depends right it depends on um, what you're after and what you see as comfortable hello okay those are really good answers thank you so much both of you guys So the next question is, how can one be a better ally and ad help advocate? You know, do I need to repeat it? I think. We can. Or how can like us? How can I? What can we do? Do you mean as part of POC or? Uh, what what do you mean um, as far as as you advocating? Um, more just in general, like what can we like, or even on this campus, just as everyday people do to advocate for like maybe just anything more finances, more teachers, more people of color, every like what do you think we could do to help advocate? So how can you advocate better? Um, I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, just hype your friends up. Hype the people who are in their careers. Um, I, I can see my girl Marika Polk there, you know, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, she was a she was part of EVAS as well. Um, and I, I remember her first conversations with me, and uh, she would always hype me up, you know. So just find somebody and hype them up for the work, even if they coloring outside the lines. You know, oh, that's a great green color. You know, wow. 
you know, sometimes we just need that motivation. Somebody needs that motivation, you know, to keep on going. They have, they, they might have woke up on the wrong side of the bed that day and not feel themselves, you know, and be like, hey, dang, I like your shoes. Like something just like that. Something to raise their self-esteem. So that's how I would advocate. And uh, like I said, uh, grab your uh, partner, your scientific, scientific buddy and take them with you, you know, show them what there is that you're doing and uh, go on a, a a research date together. But like, this is what I'm doing today. We can, I can go help you out next week, you know, just some motivation. We all need some kind of encouragement for somebody, even if it's student, faculty, professor, something like that. And uh, like I said, I've just been so lucky to have people who have hyped me up all the way here and they continue to hype me up. Uh, it's just great. You know, it's a great feeling that and I was, I was, I remember um, when I was at Centro, and so I was working there. And uh, sorry, Doctor Segovia, but I really wasn't working a lot. But I, <laughs> but I was, I was just kidding. So what I would spend doing is the students would come in, and I would try to, you know, encourage them to come in, step in, and talk, you know. And I would hear so many stories from different students. They're like, "Wow, I love what you do!" Like, and then I would ask them, "What do they do?" And they, and they get so excited about what they do too. And I remember um, this one student came in and she told me, like, she didn't want to go to law school anymore because it was like, I don't know, I can't remember the uh, exact details. And I told her, right? I told her, like, blah, 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 blah. I can't remember the details either. And just stuff that you say sticks with people so long and you just, you don't think it does stick, but it does after a long time. And uh, she she messaged me or I can't remember she messaged me or she told me right before she was about to graduate UNCW, she was like, I applied to law school because of you. I'm like, what I say? <laughs> I was confused, you know, but they told me, you know, exact, exactly what I told them. And, I was, and uh, I was surprised, you know, you just never know when people are actually listening. So, you know, be careful what you say, but also be intentional with what you say. And I was, so that's what, how you can be an advocate. Just hype them up, you know, keep telling them they're doing great. Hi, this is Dr. K. So I just want to add, and one of the way, reasons I met Jose, is we have a grant working with rural kids who expressed an interest in STEM. And um, these kids stuck with this program for three years through two hurricanes, through COVID, through a, a measles outbreak in one of the counties, everything. But um, the project was called the I-40 East, and it was about, we've got this mega highway running through rural East, Southeastern North Carolina. What's going to happen when development comes and what will happen to those communities? So the kids came up with the tagline, we're on the road to success in STEM with community pride and the science and engineering they were doing. So at the end of the year, they all had their t-shirts on and they asked me if I would have new t-shirts made for them. And I was like, because you've grown? And they said, well, yeah, we've grown, but we also, we want you to put on it. We don't need to be fixed. We need opportunities. And I think that's something, I think a little bit with what Dr. Martinez said about the imposter syndrome. I don't know how much of it was to be an imposter to have the credentials you had and have done so well as an undergraduate that to feel like you didn't deserve it because you had it easy on the end of your name and instead, what, what I'm seeing with some of these younger kids is they know they deserve it. And that's how they speak to me. I know I deserve this. And um, on another note, I do, when asked to help do interviews and recruit for an Ivy League school I attended, and they'll say to me, why couldn't you convince these kids? And a lot of them are diverse students. And I said, because they know you are targeting them because they're diverse and they know they're better than that. And they know they are worth more and you have to recruit them for who they are, not what ethnic group they represent, not what gender, not what language they speak, but because they have achieved. And quite often the truth is they have achieved with a lot of challenges put in place, maybe not even intentionally, just part of the system. So. That, that grant has been life-changing for me, working with these children. And um, Jose knows, you know, we had about a third of the kids on the project were Hispanic children. Some were here and not documented. And it was 
such an act of bravery that they showed up once a month at these community colleges to engage in STEM opportunities. It's, it's very humbling. Um, when you asked earlier, what can you do to advocate? Put yourself in somebody else's shoes if you can and, and just understand. That's one of the things we're trying to do with POC is to develop a sense of empathy towards these journeys other people have to take. Thank you so much for that input, Dr. K. I do also want to throw in a quick note that I feel like it's very important to have a willingness to learn and to listen, especially when it's something that you're maybe not very familiar with. I always, before I came to UNCW, I was very uncomfortable like meeting a bunch of different people because I grew up in a predominantly white environment. So coming to UNCW and seeing the different diversity centers, I got really nervous. But the first one I went into was Centro Hispano. And I just sat in there and I met people and I was just trying to, I didn't talk very much, but I just tried to learn people's names and just learn about them because, you know, it's better to learn. So then you can, you know, be a good advocate and ally. But yeah, okay. So next we are gonna move on to our next question. Oh, it's our last question, actually, and it is, is there any advice you would give to students who are just now starting out in their field? Hi, this is Morgan O'Connell. I'm running the camera, so I'm going to stay off the camera. Um, also, because like everyone else mentioned, imposter syndrome is real. But one of the things that I think I have learned in my STEM journey is the best thing you can do is meet your professors and the faculty. Introduce yourself, say who you are, and start getting involved. And it's scary, and it's hard, and it feels strange. But that is probably my biggest regret as an undergraduate student is not being brave enough to start that engagement early on. And if you just meet one person, they may be able to change your entire life or introduce you to the person who does change your life. What was the question? <laughs> Oh, advice for first-year students. Um, definitely get involved. You know, um, Morgan was saying, um, meet your professors, get involved. Um, uh, I would like to add, um, know your community, know where you're at. A Wilmington's a bubble, and Wilmington's not the same 25 miles down or 25 miles south, because I think that's Myrtle Beach. We don't go that way. But, um, yeah, Wilmington's a bubble, so get to know your community, get to know what the problems are in your community. Um, Try out new things, you know, in, even if it's working uh, on a um, blueberry farm or working with snails or just try everything you can. You'll find out what you like. And if you're like me, um, I still don't know what I want to really like. I like everything. So I like trying new things. Um, learn everything there is to know. Uh, so I didn't know anything about GIS and getting up grad school. And man, let me tell you, I'm not a pro, but I, I can use it more or less. And uh, so learn new skills, try new things, meet your professors, know your community. I could keep going with the list of what things you should do, but um, I'll let you figure out the rest out once you get there. But it's really important to just communicate and listen. You never know where you'll end up at and who your friends will turn out to be. Yeah, I think everybody pretty much answered what I was thinking. Uh, the only thing I could add on to, um, you know, meeting the professors is finding a mentor. I think the biggest part of that is finding somebody who's going to support you, someone who's going to meet with you and give you guidance, um, give you direction as to what are the next steps, what should I be doing next, um, to make sure that you're going in the right direction and, um, you know, it's great to encourage students to say, do what you love, but is it going to profit you, profit you in the end? Um, a mentor, a good mentor would help you through that um, and help guide you in the right direction.
I just wanted to add a quick little piece um, I, that I, I, I don't think is very tapped, uh, the UNCW alumni pool. You know, to, to be a Seahawk, we say once a Seahawk, always a Seahawk. And we have thousands of uh, alumni who have uh, walked a, a similar path and to, you know, to reach out to alumni relations or even to your professors to say, hey, do you know an alumni that uh, you can recommend I interview? Uh, I chat with, we definitely need to uh, be leaning on that resource a lot more. And um, yes, just, I would recommend that you interview somebody who is already doing uh, the job that you might consider or in a similar field and just ask simple questions. You know, how did you get here? What are the pros and cons of your field? Uh, what is next? And just all it takes is 20, 30 minutes of somebody's time for you to uh, expand your network and get a little bit of just additional insight on what you might do. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I guess we can wrap it up now. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you amazing answers from both our panelists and those who came to watch the presentation. Do we have any more questions before we can wrap it up and do a closing. Nope. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone who has joined us on via Zoom, via in person. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, our host as well. Um, um, thanks again, all of you guys for coming. We hope you guys enjoyed our POC conference again we hope to see you guys at our next one so keep an eye on the center for marine science instagram page as well as marine quest instagram page for an update and we hope to see you guys next time have a great one